Uh, I'm sitting here sanding away. This is Saturday morning. And uh, I'm starting on 320. So I think I will have all these knives ready for heat treatment uh, and tempering today, Saturday. Tomorrow I'll get them out of the tempering oven and clean them all up and possibly get the handles on by Sunday afternoon. Wouldn't that be nice? And uh, Monday, shape the handles. Yep. That's if I can stay after this. Anyway, I'm sitting here sanding and you know, I have a lot of time. Just like when I was driving a truck, I had a lot of time to think. And sitting here sanding, it doesn't take a whole lot of brain. So uh, I have a lot of time to think. And I was thinking about, I know you're probably tired of hearing about this, but the only reason I continue to think about this is because it bothered me so terribly. And that is the guy that cheated me out of a knife. And it finally dawned on me. It, it, it absolutely is not about the knife. I, I mean, as a matter of fact, I have, you know, $900 worth of knives that I'll be giving away probably the beginning of next week. So it's not about the knife. It's about the complete betrayal of trust. That's what it boils down to. And that's why it's so painful because it is such a complete and total betrayal of trust that one man has in another. Just like you're driving down a two-lane road, one lane going in each direction, you trust that person coming at you to stay on their side of that double line. And that person trusts you to stay on your side of that double line. And that trust works for as long as there's been cars on the road, people have trusted one another. And, you know, there's lots of other examples of trust in total strangers that you have a right to expect from them. And uh, I think when you're sending someone something that you spent weeks of hard work making you have a right to trust them to pay you for it. And it's only happened once, and since then I've sent out many more knives without being paid in advance for them, and nobody else has cheated me out of my, my money. Uh, just that one guy. And it, it, that's what it is all about. It's the betrayal of trust that one human has in another. Now granted, I... I'm an old guy, and probably I should readjust my, my views on how trustworthy humans, by and large, are nowadays. And I think that's also what pains me, is that the world is changing, and it's changing in, in a fashion that hurts me. I don't want to go through my life not being able to trust people. I just, I, I don't want to think about a world where one man can't trust another to do the right thing. And uh, I guess that's why it's bothered me so much, because it <clears throat> it's, it's a slap in the face of, of human nature, trust. And our whole society is based on that kind of basic human trust. And uh, the, the realization that that kind of basic human trust is being broken more and more often, being betrayed more and more often. Uh, and it's a, it's a sad realization to know that the world that I knew for 60 plus years is probably gone. And, uh, you know, the person that cheated me out of that knife, he's probably about the same age as me, so he's well aware of that kind of trust, and he grew up in the same world I grew up in, granted, in different countries, but close enough in similarity to, uh, to uh, suspect that he grew up expecting the same things from other humans that I grew up expecting, which was trust and honor. So... 
Oh, yeah, that's what it's all about with me. It, it's absolutely not about the knife, not at all. It's just the, the knife is a symbol of the betrayal of trust. And uh, the fact that I'm having to sit here and rethink my, my perception of society could be wrong now. And it's not that my perception has changed. It's that the world has changed and I haven't. So maybe it's time to change. Okay, back to Sandin. Oh yeah, there's one other epiphany that I had while sitting here sanding. I was thinking about uh, today's music and, uh, you know, stupid, ridiculous lyrics and uh, insulting and, uh, you know, they use words that we just wouldn't use in our day. And then I got to thinking about the lyrics for uh, a song called Good Morning Starshine by Oliver. And here's some of the lyrics. Glitty glub gloopy. Nibby, nabby, noopy. Saba, sibby, saba. Nubi, abba, naba. Tubi, ubi, walla. Nubi, abba, naba. And you got to remember the commas or the words take on a whole different meaning. So uh, maybe I'll just shut up about stupid music. <laughs> oh, man. Still sanding. But it's coffee time. This is uh, 400. I am on the second knife. That knife is up to 400. This is the second knife. And I'll have to do that knife up to 400. And that's 600 on all three of them. And then I buff them all out real good. And then uh, heat treat and temper them. So uh, I'm still sitting here thinking. And uh, I think that this should probably be called uh, Thoughts from the Knife Shop. Or something like that. Because I'm doing very little knife making. And a whole lot of thinking. Anyway, uh, I was thinking about miscommunication and how easy it is to misread people's thoughts, uh, especially through email or text message. And uh, I'll back up a little bit. I have told you that I'm hard of hearing. Well, when everybody started wearing masks, uh, I realized how much I relied on watching people's lips to understand what they were saying. Words that I didn't hear, you know, if they were making a W sound, like, you know, the words where, when, why, what. They all start with the same w, w, you know, and your lips make this certain pattern to, to, to say that sound. And just like the O or the A, ah, I mean, say, you know, say, say those, uh, basically the vowels, A, E, I, O, U, and sometimes Y, except after C. <laughs> uh, people make the same mouth movements, okay? I guess I don't know how to say it any different. But when you cover your face up, uh, people who are on the edge of, you know, hard of hearing, suddenly... They're not, they don't get the benefit, the cues of looking at your face as you talk and watching. Well, let's say I didn't hear the word you, but I saw your lips form the Y sound, and my brain says, well, he probably means you, uh, you know, based on what else I heard. I mean, your brain does this automatically, and you don't realize how much you rely on being able to see people's lips until their face is covered with the masks. So it makes it even harder and really, really aggravating. And it aggravates other people like cashiers, you know. So most of the time, I just smile and nod and pretend I hear. Or, uh, you know, I, I, anyway, this leads me up to the next thing. Now, I grew up in an era where the only communication you had was television or phone or the written word on a typewriter, which, you know, that rarely, in my world, nobody wrote letters or, uh, you know, rarely wrote letters. So the most basic and, mo and most often performed form of communication was face-to-face -face or on a landline. Well, the other day I had an email exchange with somebody 
And uh, we both left offended. And both of us were offended for completely wrong reasons. I mean, I was wrong thinking he meant something he didn't, and he was wrong thinking I meant something I didn't, and that is how easy it is to read something wrong without the benefit of talking on the phone. See, you don't realize, just like I didn't realize, how dependent I was on being able to see people's facial expressions and how their lips moved in in hearing them. when you take away voice inflections and tone uh, and facial expressions, such as through email, uh, it makes it even easier to misconstrue, misconstrue something that wasn't meant a particular way and you take it that way. Uh, the example is somebody wanted a knife made a certain way and I'd already cut out knives of that particular steel that I didn't have anymore a, a way that he didn't want him. So I offer him another way of getting a knife now instead of waiting until whenever my steel came in and I had no idea when it was going to come in. And he he perceived it as I just wanted to hurry up and make him a knife and get him out of my hair. Well, I offered him to make it out of the thicker metal that I make my other knives out of, which I have plenty of. So I perceived him thinking that uh, I was wanting to make a knife just to get him out of my hair or that's what his email said and he you know that's my point is it was total miscommunication so that's what I'm sitting here thinking about how easy it is and how much more effort I have to put in now I'm a baby boomer I grew up in an era where you know email and computers it's a different world and if If you're not born into this world, you have to really, really struggle to adapt to it. And uh, some people can't. I mean, I know people my age who... Let me straighten the dog out. I know people my age who wouldn't even know how to turn on a computer. Never mind have a YouTube channel. Uh, I know people who have the old uh, flip phones simply because they cannot... uh, Some of them by choice but a lot of them, they couldn't operate an iPhone. So it's a huge, huge jump in technology, and baby boomer brains are not typically easily adaptable to this new technology, and this new form of communication, which leaves people my age at a real disadvantage, uh, and makes us prone to, more often prone to miscommunication. So. If you're still here, <laughs> that's what I've been sitting here thinking about. How uh, over the years it, I've noticed this has happened an awful lot, and how it has affected uh, even some friendships. You know, uh, people said something uh, just the other day. Somebody asked me about whether my my pretty knives. Now, let me say this up front. I know the guy. He's a friend. He's been a subscriber for a long time. So I know in advance that he didn't mean anything other than a very simple and honest question. But it would be real easy to take offense. Number one, I'm kind of sensitive about my knives. I'm very proud about... I'm proud about my knives. It's, you know, that's all I'm going to say. So I have to temper that with the fact that it was just a very simple straightforward and honest uh, question and it was whether my pretty knives would do well in uh, camping or a bushcraft or having a hell beat out of mountain woods and uh, I answered him in the comment knowing that he didn't mean anything then the the question he was asking there was no hidden meaning like uh, because my knives were pretty somehow they weren't worthy of uh, you know, or they weren't built to the same standards that a actual knife you would use in the woods were. So later, I, actually yesterday's video, I explained a little better than I explained in a comment that all my knives are made from 1084 steel, and just because I go to the extra lengths to make them purdy doesn't mean they're not good usable knives underneath the purdy. So that's how easy it is 
and how often it happens. And if it happens often to me, I'm just a regular person, I'm sure it happens often to, to other people too, where they, especially older folks who, who grew up relying on intonation and facial expressions as part as an important part of communication. And now we're communicating through email and text more often than not. And uh, it's a real hazard to older folks to try very hard not to take offense when it wasn't intended to be offensive and and to word things in a way we're not where we are not I mean that's another way we have to be careful to word things carefully so what we're saying isn't taken in a way that we don't mean it okay I'm gonna drink my coffee and then get back to Sandy so uh sorry I'm thinking out loud here All right, we are sanded all up to, can you see how close, I mean, this, these are that close to being identical and I do this by hand, one at a time. So they're all sanded up to 600 and now we go to the buffing room and uh, start buffing them out and then heat treat them and temper them and tomorrow we clean them all up, put the handles on. All right, I've got all three buffed oh god they're coming out so pretty they're all buffed up and uh this is when, when it pains me to uh heat treat them because they come out of the heat treatment and then go into tempering oven and all the schmutz gets baked on and i basically got to start all over cleaning the blades up but i've i have tried in the past uh to cut some corners or to make this process a little quicker by not polishing them before I put them in the uh, oven before he treat them and it just doesn't work you can never whatever point you stop before heat treating is where you start when it comes out of the heat treating and tempering oven I and I guess it's because of the hardness of the steel you can't go back so you have to get them as good as you want them to look before you heat treat them and then it you you know it's it's work but you can you can get them as good as it looked before you put them in the heat treating so this is what it'll look like after i finish the all the work tomorrow today i will heat treat and temper these and tomorrow i will come out take them out of the oven i'll just let them sit and cool overnight and uh then I will come back in here, clean them all up, and uh, this is uh, Abel's. I mean, they may all, they're all the same. They may all get mixed up tomorrow, but it doesn't matter. They're absolutely identical. And, you know, there's still polishing compound on these. Here, I'll, I'll rub some of this off and I'll show you. There we go. And there's one little right there, but it all come off. And what I have to do is take acetone to get the uh, polishing compound off of it. And I have to do the whole blade like that so the epoxy will stick to the metal. I likey. All right, let me go. Uh, I'm going to pre-treat my heat treating oven. Go turn my forge on. In uh, about an hour, we'll have all three of these done and in the uh, heat treating oven. And then I'm going to go home and take a shower because I got polishing stuff all over me. 
All right, I'm going to preheat this, but I've got uh, an external, well, it's not external, but it's a standalone thermometer because uh, I have this on convection, and apparently convection ovens maintain a steadier heat. I got this set on 400, and uh, we'll see what that, by the time I get all three of these heat treated, uh, I should have a pretty accurate temperature on that to see if this is accurate. So let me go uh, crank up the four. Well, look at there. Exactly 400. All right. So uh, here they are. Let me show you how ugly they look when they come out of the heat treatment. Okay, two hours, we will see you tomorrow.